Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Andrew Martin from Andrew Martin Energy here with your June energy transmission. Can you believe that it is June already? We are at the midpoint of this year, y'all. We are at the crux, we are at the fulcrum, we are at the center, which is really kind of apt for a lot of what I'm gonna share with you today. The um, June energy transmission is entitled The Unified Masculine. We have a lot of things to talk about today, a lot of things to cover, so get a pen and paper. I'm going to be sharing some messages from the lighted ones with you. I'm gonna be sharing sort of my perspective and my take on what the messages are this week. Really what June's message is all about is giving you some understanding Understanding, some perspective and some practical tools that you can apply directly to your experience to help you navigate what's going on. More and more we are seeing a big division and a big separation between what is happening out there and what is happening with us internally. And as always, what we can remember is one of the primary teachings from the Lighted Ones is that the internal is the primary reality, the external is the secondary reality, and the internal always creates the external. So really what we can do this month in June is use the external world, the mirror, as an experience to clue us in into what's going on internally and where we have an opportunity to create positive lasting change also have a way that we can begin to use resistance as a good thing, using resistance as a tool, all of this and more in this month's update. I have my notes here as always that I'll be referring to as we go through. What is the unified masculine? Essentially, the unified masculine is the divine masculine. The divine is in all things and the divine is all that is. The separated masculine or what we have sort of been referring to as the toxic masculine, which Personally, I don't really like the idea of toxic masculine because to me that's a judgment that puts it over there. And anytime we judge anything, all we're doing is separating ourselves from it. So I like the idea of separated masculine versus unified masculine. The separated masculine is essentially the masculine that serves only itself. Right, We can look at this experience of the patriarchy and these collapsing and crumbling institutions that were built upon exclusion, and we can see that the masculine that is the unified masculine, the masculine that serves the feminine, the masculine that serves the truth, works in service of love, compassion, kindness. That to me is what the unified masculine is. The separated masculine is exclusionary, it's violent, it's oppressive, it's reactionary, it's aggressive. The unified masculine serves the feminine self. It takes its cues for external action and doing from the emotional, intuitive, inspired self, which is the feminine self. And from my perspective, everything is feminine first. And I believe that source, the eternal spirit, is feminine first. So in short, the feminine feels and the masculine then takes those feelings, those insights and inspiration and puts them into action, into building, into doing. One of the ways that I like to think of the unified masculine is, and I'm having this experience a lot in my own life actually, the unified masculine is the young father watching his newborn child. What the child needs when it is an infant, when it is a newborn, and it can't even sit up, it can't even focus, it can't do anything but just be, that is, its needs are different than they are when the child begins to learn how to sit up. Its needs then change. Then when the child learns how to crawl and then begins to learn how to walk and then begins to learn how to ride a bike and so on and so on, the needs of the child are going to change. But from the perspective of the unified masculine, the approach is always the same. So here are some keys for the unified masculine. Providing gentle correction when necessary. Loving without the threat. And this is what I mean by that. If we look at all of these examples out there of often the male embodiment of separated masculine energy, again, it is violent, it is aggressive, it is punishment, it is saying if you don't do this, then you're going to be punished. If you don't follow these rules, then these bad things are going to happen. So loving without the threat, justice without violence, assertion without aggression, and protection without exclusion. We're talking about the unified masculine in the context of the unified self, right? We have the feminine self, we have the masculine self, and these two coming together in union. And I've talked about this before. If we use the Vesica Piscis as an image and an avatar for what's happening energetically and happening within our systems and our bodies, it is this unification that creates the portal and the opening to the child 
which is the beginning of the process of ascension, which I'm going to talk a little bit later in about a little bit later in this video. But here is, and to me, the way that we sort of process through our experience is we go through the process of healing. Initially, the process of healing is an, a dismantling one. It is a process of subtraction. It is a process of loss. It is essentially taking apart the machine, right? If I'm looking at myself and I say, okay, this is who Andrew has been up until this point and it ain't working anymore. So it's time for me to dismantle what I have believed or have been taught or have been, you know, sort of forced to agree to that who Andrew is as a human being on this planet and all of the things that my biology and my appearance and all of that entail. And so essentially, initially, we go through the process of taking it all apart. And you go through this process of chaos and collapse. And you go through this process of saying, yeah, that's not true anymore. I don't want that anymore. That doesn't serve me anymore. And then we go through the process eventually of beginning to heal, beginning to put ourselves back together consciously, deliberately, and on purpose without needing to accept the projections of the external world as our truth when it's not. Then we go through the process of healing and eventually we get to this process of unification where we are able to put our arms around all that we are and say yes to it. So here is a message from the Lighted Ones and their perspective on the ideas of healing and unification. Change can't happen without first accepting things as they are. In the beginning, this truth teaches unconditional love and acceptance of all that is as it is. This position continues as the parts of you that require healing and transformation arrive and show you where your wounds are. To me, a wound is just time hanging on to something that isn't true for me. However, your first action is not to require these aspects to change. First you accept, then you assess. Then eventually you begin to recreate the stories, the beliefs, and the perceptions, essentially rewriting the script of your inner reality. In other words, it's not, hey, you, hey, part of myself that I've been excluding forever. Hey, part of myself that I haven't wanted to look at until recently. Come over here and tell me your story so I can change you, right? I use this example quite a bit. It's like saying to a child, I only like you when you're happy. You're only my child when you're a good kid. So until you can be happy, until you can get rid of those parts of you that I don't like, you're not my child. So come back to me when you're happy, bright, and shiny, i.e. come back to me when you are in a mood that allows me to feel good about you being my child. So it's not, hey, you come over here and tell me your story so I can change you or fix you. It's, hey, you're a part of me and I want to know what your story is, period. That's it. As you witness the entirety of your inner narrative, right? As you get inside and you begin to navigate and tr you know traverse your inner landscape. Yes, the dark, shadowy, funky stuff that you haven't wanted to look at. The bright, beautiful, lovely stuff that you can't wait to share. All of it. And as you begin to explore and refamiliarize yourself with all of it, you start to see the whole picture and you start to see things in a context that things begin to make sense and the unified self and the unification of self begins to make connections and things start popping and you go, oh my God, that makes sense. I finally get it. But that is not going to happen until you stop excluding parts of yourself. So even as we begin to traverse our inner landscape and see these aspects of self come home for acknowledgement, integration, or release, it's not at the exclusion of these aspects. Again, it's not saying, oh God, come over here so I can fix you because I'm so sick and tired of you being a problem. It's essentially being that loving, benevolent father, putting your arms around all of it and pulling it close so that they can then begin to see through your example of what a life built upon love, compassion, and truth really looks like. Here's my example. So, you know, it's sort of like I use this example quite a bit. Like you're six years old and your Auntie Jane, who you're really, really close with, you come to her and you say, hey, Auntie Jane, I have a crush on somebody at school. And she says, oh no, honey, don't fall in love. Love is for suckers and you're only gonna get hurt. Clearly, as a six-year-old, this is your aunt with, you know, pres presumably no romantic experience at six years old. This is your Auntie Jane spewing her unresolved stuff onto you. It's her projections from her love life and her heartbreak and her misery and her unresolved stuff that she's now trying to sell to you as the truth with a capital T. 
It is not the truth with a capital T. It is her truth with a little t. Literally, the smallest part of her is what is projecting this truth. The wounded, angry, hurt part of her that she has not yet faced and resolved is the part of her that is transmitting this idea and it's being sold to you as truth. Well, you're six years old, so you don't necessarily have the wherewithal to understand that this may not necessarily be true. Certainly, there may be a part of you that inside is like, oh, I don't know, that doesn't really feel good. But again, she's an authority figure. She's your favorite auntie, so why wouldn't you believe her, right? So fast forward 20 years, and here you are string out, you know, in a string of failed relationship after failed relationship after failed relationship with no real conscious understanding of why you can't find love. Guess what? It's because on some level, Auntie Jane's narrative and her truth that you have adopted is in there running subconsciously in the body, in the energy, in the emotions, in the mind, and that's what's gumming up the gears. Here is the T. When you accepted that truth that was the small truth that was true for Jane, but not true for you, and you begin to integrate it and try to weave it into your system, essentially it breaks off part of you. It creates a separation. It creates a division. It's like when you're driving a spike into a log and you're trying to split it. So part of you has been split off. So part of you is disintegrated because part of you is hanging on to a belief that isn't true. And so it is not able to be integrated into the fullness of self because it can't stand if it's not true, right? So when we look at it from this perspective, it's the realization that quite simply what's going on is you adopted a belief that wasn't true for you and it's not the part of you that believes that that needs to change. The six-year-old self that still believes that that is true on some level, that's not the part of you that needs to change or to go. What needs to change is the belief. But the only way that can happen is when we are willing to go in there and say, listen, baby, what's going on? Tell me why you believe this. Tell me why you're in such pain around love and relationships. Tell me why it's so hard for you to trust or to integrate or to believe, you know, or to merge or unite with another person, whatever it is. It's because that part of you is still hanging on to that thing. And the minute that that part of you sees the truth and you do the work to process that, then it is moved out of the system and now that part of you can integrate again and now you are united. Now you are more unified. Now you are more merged with the truth of who you are. And that's essentially the process that we go through healing anything internally. Basically what it comes down to is everything is welcome, but only love can stay. Here's another part of it. Some of these parts of ourselves were not designed to go beyond a certain point of our life. So not every part of you is going to be integrated and is going to stay. Some parts of you are going to tell you what they know, tell you their story so that you can begin to receive that and integrate that with love and compassion. And once you've done that, then they go, they die, they move on. And that's just part of how it works. So here is some information that I want to share with you. This is my belief and this is my perspective. The only reason that we continue to experience anything over and over and over is because on some level it still lives within our body. So within, so without. The war is in the body, right? We can march up and down our street with the sign protesting all that we want over and over and over. And that's part of it. That's part of it. But until we also turn that lens of requirement that we are projecting out onto the external world, until we turn that on ourselves and begin to ask some questions of ourselves, some really deep, challenging, hard questions, as in, where am I still, you know, betraying myself in the name of my oppressor? Where am I still using violence against myself that I learned from the external world? What we often don't see is how we repeat the same cycles over and over and over without knowing what we're doing because, again, we're given these tools and these beliefs and these perspectives from a very young age. And so often we don't ever really stop to ask, is this true? Is this the most effective way to get what I want? Will this get me what I want at all? And is this what I want? Right? So we have to be willing to go inside and ask these really tough questions so that we can end the war within. This is part of when we get into this message about resistance. And here's what the lighted ones say about resistance. And I think that, you know, resistance is a good thing, right? Resistance can be used as a tool for positive change. When resistance is good, 
we realize that resistance is a stop on the road to unity. Resistance is not a means unto itself. If resistance for the sake of resistance worked, we would not be where we are. So much of what we are seeing out there is important. It is necessary and we've got to eventually move beyond the mindset that says no. No, no, you can't do that. I won't look at it. I won't see it. I don't want it anymore. That is the beginning. And this is when we can use resistance as a tool for change because resistance is necessary to stop a tidal wave of momentum. Resistance is the part of us that goes, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I don't want to do this again. I don't want to go through the same, you know, same broken relationship. I don't want to say, date the same asshole for the 13th time, right? Different face, different guy, different name, same exact experience. So in those moments when we are cued into, and this is where we use the mirror, right? We go, no, wait a minute. I, I, I'm going back into that danger zone and I don't want to go back there. That is resistance used as a tool for positive change because it helps us to stop patterns. It helps us to stop unconscious behavior. It helps to it helps us to push pause on that narrative and go, wait a minute, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to see this again. So what within me is still activated and attached to that? And that is the question that begins to turn us within so that we can begin to make some change. So use resistance as a way to slow things down. So you don't have to go into reactionary mode. You don't have to go into fight or flight mode. You use resistance as a, you're the mirror of resistance to go, okay, something within me is incongruent. Something within me isn't really within the center. So I'm going to use this resistance to slow it down. I'm going to come back to that state of unconditional love, which from my perspective is a neutral state of being. Unconditional love is exactly that. It is unconditional. So we can use resistance to begin to really listen to the part of us that is in pain. Listen to the part of us that is afraid. Listen to the part of us that still feels rejected or neglected or excluded. And we can use resistance as a way to go, okay, I just need to love myself through this. I may not know how to solve it yet, but I'm going to activate my benevolent unified masculine self. And just like a child who is upset and you say, what's wrong, baby? They say, I don't know. I'm just upset. Okay. That's enough. I can just acknowledge that I'm upset right now and I don't need a solution. I don't need an answer. I don't need to fix it. So I can just pull my arms around myself, pull myself in, and then you are reminded of the truth. Then you are reminded of who you really are. Then you put yourself in that position of the fullness of all that you are and you see that this is just a part of you that needs your love and attention. This is what we do over and over and over is essentially finding this part of ourselves until the child within us, that part of us that was harmed or that was hurt or that is triggered, remembers that the war is just within the body and we're going to end it, baby. We're going to end it. So we use our external experience as a mirror to direct us back within ourselves. This to me is what healing is. It is essentially the unification and the ability to put your arms around all that you are and love it all. This is what the lighted ones have to say about resistance. Resistance is not the end, yet it can be the beginning of real lasting change. The idea that one can just blot something out and cancel it creates a false reality. It provides a sense of progress and change when all that's really happening is you cut the head off the monster. It will appear to you that you have slain the monster. But what has really happened is the monster is simply going underground to take on a new form only to reemerge again. If one thinks that continuing to scream at the mirror will change the person staring back at them, then they have created a life of continuous suffering. Use the mirror as a tool to see clearly where you have an opportunity to create inner change. This is the only thing that ever creates a shift in the outer world. When one hasn't built a strong inner structure to support the external changes they're requiring of the outer world, it creates a reality that is very fragile and unstable. You are essentially living in an eggshell, constantly running around in a panic to ensure that the shell is never cracked. To simply redecorate the world, forcing it to look and sound like something that is pleasing to you in order to feel better, without also doing the inner work to clear your trauma and your triggers, 
It's just a hit off the pipe. Simply repainting the exterior of a broken house, expecting that a new paint job will fix the structural issues, is a lie. If one's inner world doesn't feel, look, and sound like what they're requiring the outer world to look, feel, and sound like, then they've just redecorated it. If one hasn't acquired the inner tools of understanding and acceptance to shift the inner world, then they're constantly going to be on guard against the eternal oppressor. When the inner work hasn't been done parallel to the demands that are made of the outer world, then eventually that external world will simply fall back into the same patterns of disarray and dysfunction. Once you realize and accept the truth of this, you will increasingly find yourself drawn into new ways of being. You will find that the requirement to focus on the outer experience becomes less and less as your master creator abilities come back online and you remember that the inner world creates the outer. Big stuff. <laughs> so here are some keys for you, right? Here is time when you can get down your pen and paper and start to write down. These are some tools that I have for you to support you as you move through this process of unification. Look, I get it, y'all. It is not easy to accept that we are the ones perpetuating the violence against ourselves over and over and over by refusing to go inside and do the same requirement for ourselves that we are asking of the external world. I get it. When you are oppressed and you have been suppressed and you have you know, found yourself at the outside of society over and over again, and you've had your voice taken away from you, when you first get it back and you wake up, it is a rage, it is a fire, and you are screaming at the top of your lungs, and that is important. And also remember, so within, so without. If I continually find myself in a battleground, it is because there is still a war within me. So here are some keys. Balance within, finding a way to unify ourselves is essential as we proceed because what we are looking at now in our creations and our choices and our actions and where our beliefs are taking us is we are creating what is going to define our personal and our collective experience for the next few decades. We are lo The choices that I am looking at right now, this is not just like, oh, I'm going to do this for six months and now I'm done. No, what we're looking at now, y'all, is like, what are, have you committed to? because this is going to be a part of your experience for the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and beyond. So these are the questions. Are you choosing with all of you in the room? Or are you choosing in spite of the parts that still make you uncomfortable? Are you just expecting that you can just cancel everything else out there that you don't like without doing the work to explore why you're always triggered by that? Not going to work. You've got to find a way to, yes, require a new experience outside of you, but that always begins first to go, okay, what is it within me that gets so angry, that gets so triggered, that feels so unsafe when I hear or see these things? That's part of your work. The feminine is half of the story. The feminine self is the intuitive, emotional, inspirational, watery, unformed self. She's the one that says, this is what I want my life to be like now. This is the reality that I want to experience now. These are the feelings and the emotions and the, and the parts of, of life that I want to weave into my day to day. The masculine is the other half of the story. The masculine is the one that listens to the feminine self and says, okay, it's time to build a new reality. And these are the ingredients that we're going to use to build it. The feminine without the masculine is just a collapse. It's just intuition. It's just chaos. It's just water. It's just movement and ideas without ever taking action on them. The masculine without the feminine is blunt. It is aggressive, right? It's violent. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know why I'm doing it, right? This is what I, you know, why the emotional architecture is so important because the emotional architecture puts us in touch with what we really want, which the only reason we ever want anything is because of how we think it will help us feel, be in from an emotional feeling or energy perspective. This is why it's so crucial that we begin to honor both halves of the self, right? The feminine is one that feels, the masculine is the one that does. Together, they create the truth with a capital T. That's the child. In order for the portal, internal portal, for to open for the child to enter, we must find balance in the masculine and feminine. And the child is what opens the portal for ascension. Ascension isn't something you go and buy. Ascension isn't something that you actually do. Ascension is a way of being. 
And your way of being will certainly inspire new choices, actions, and beliefs, but it's a feeling thing first. It's a being state first before it's doing. Think of it this way. So think of the triangle. I talked about this in the most recent um, Oracle card reading. Think of the pyramid, the triangle, like equilateral, right? All three sides are equal length and we've got three 45 degree angles. So at the bottom, at the base of the pyramid, the triangle, we have the masculine and we have the feminine. These two are in balance and as they come into balance and the center opens, right? Because that's how we have to come into balance is finding the center, finding the fulcrum. And as these two aspects of self come into balance, guess what? Then we move to the peak of the pyramid, the peak of the equilateral triangle. That is the child, which is directly that angle from a geometric perspective. If you do the geometry, you will see that the center is the peak of that pyramid. So the center of the base, the fulcrum point, and in order to transcend and ascend beyond this dualistic either or polarity consciousness, you've got to come into balance. You've got to find the center. And once you find the center, pop then that opens the portal for ascension. And then that process just begins. It's like, a, it's like childbirth. Once that child is coming, you can't stop it. And the child is only going to come when the experiences, the environments are correct and they are right. And they are in a place where they can support the child. Dealing with your shadow aspects. I know that one of the hardest things can often be to look at these shadowy parts of ourself. Uh, trust me, I speak from experience. But this is something to consider. Our shadowy aspects aren't necessarily in need of transforming into something light and bright, right? It's not a love and light. Like that's part of it. Love and light is part of it. But so is our chaos. So is our darkness. That's also part of it. We need all of it to be a full unified self. And it is our self in our benevolent state of being that sets the boundaries and says, yeah, honey, I get that you're the one that always wants to go on a rampage and burn it all down, but that's just not appropriate here, right? I can acknowledge this part of me and say, yep, I get it. You're my darkness and that's fine. I love you and I hold you close to me. I just don't let you run the show. Because think of it this way. There are parts of you that are born to thrive in the darkness. There are parts of you that are created to thrive in the darkness. Think of like shade loving plants. I'm gonna use that experience, you know, because I'm out in the out in the garden planting my flowers and tending to my plants. There are plants that need the shade, they need the darkness. They don't really do well in the direct sunlight. Think of animals, you know, like the panther, nocturnal animals. I, I recently had a client. Uh, we were doing some work together in the void sessions and she was saying, you know, as we were coming to the end of our series together, she was like, oh my God, this whole week in my meditation and my visions, the panther was following me. She was with me and I just kept trying to appease her and get her to stop following me. But what she realized is the panther is there as an aspect of her that thrives in the darkness, that thrives in the shadows, that knows how to traverse those aspects and those places within us that are not illuminated and it's okay. So we don't necessarily need to get rid of these shadow aspects. We need to let them understand that they are welcome and they are part of our internal kingdom. They're just not the ones sitting in the throne. So here is one of my favorite prompts that I use when dealing with the shadow aspect. So when I'm dealing with a part of me that wants to go into old behavior, that wants to numb out, that wants to avoid, that wants to unplug, that just wants to, you know, make it all go away or wants to burn it all down and be, you know, the flamethrower of anger and just like fuck it all. This is what I use. You can do whatever you want. You just have to tell me why. To me, that is the epitome of the benevolent unified masculine that says to this inner self, like, okay, baby, I get it. You want to go on a rampage. You want to go on a bender. You want to unplug and just completely lose yourself. That's fine. You can do whatever you want. You just have to tell me why. The trick here and what happens when we use this prompt is number one, we use resistance to stop the flow. We use resistance to slow things down. We find a part of us that says, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm freaking out. I'm overwhelmed. It's too much. I'm triggered and I just want to unplug and head, hide my head in the sand. Okay, you can do that, but you have to tell me why you want to do that. So immediately we interrupt the unconscious pattern that often takes us into places that we go, God, why did I do that again? I don't want to be in the shame spiral anymore. So you can do whatever you want. You just have to tell me why stops that unconscious behavior. It stops that, that tidal wave of momentum that you often feel helpless against. And it gives you some time to take a breath and to tune in and go, okay, why do I want that part? Why does that part of me want to go do these things? What is it that I'm really looking for? 
And then you get an answer, right? It might be, well, I feel afraid and I don't want to be afraid anymore. I feel overwhelmed. So I just kind of want to calm it down or go numb. So what it does is it gives you what the actual need is. And then it provides an opportunity for you to decide there's a new way to do it. And this is the second part. So the first part is you can do whatever you want. You just have to tell me why. Gives you a place to do some introspection, some journaling, some meditating, some self-talk, whatever you do. And then the next part, once you've identified what this impulse is really trying to do for you, because really these shadow aspects, these parts of us that we often call dysfunctional, they're just a part of us that's trying to do what it thinks will help us, right? It's doing what, well, in the past I did this and it worked, right? It made the pain go away or it helped me avoid a situation that I wasn't ready to contend with. So these parts of ourselves aren't out to get us. They're just doing what they, they think is the best possible option in that moment. So the next thing you say is, okay, I get it. You want to feel safe. You want to feel, you know, more at ease. You want to feel less overwhelmed. You want to feel more stable. You want to feel more clear or whatever it is. Let's think of another way that we can do that. There's got to be another way that we can do that, right? It's like, again, the father correcting his child. Like, I get you're angry. It's okay that you're angry, but let's use your words. Let's find a way for you to talk. That's the feminine self. Let's get a way. Let's find a way for you to express your emotions, express your feelings, express your desires. Because when I really listen to you, then that gives me an agenda that is unified with self rather than is excluding self. The masculine self, and the reason that I love this this key, is the masculine self often struggles with emotions. It often struggles with these big feelings and these big internal you know, ruptures that are ready to come out because the emotions come via the feminine self. And the masculine's job is doing. The masculine's job is taking action. And if it doesn't really understand what an emotion means, oftentimes it's just going to use whatever it can as like a club just to beat it down. Right? I don't know what to do. I'm just going to beat it into submission until I no longer feel this way. The feminine offers these emotional states as a sense of being. The feminine emotional state is just about what is there. Emotions just are, right? They're just present. And the masculine is about doing, and so it doesn't often understand, and so it thinks these emotional states are something to be fixed or to be solved when they're not. In reality, an emotional state is simply pointing us to what is currently activated within us. It's pointing us to what is currently coming to the surface and what is present. And the feminine uses these emotional states and impulses to point to us what is currently at play and what needs to change. So here are some keys for perhaps understanding what your emotions are trying to tell you. Now, these are not absolute. This is not saying that every time you feel this, it's always that. But again, using an emotional state of, you know, where we feel like, oh gosh, I'm feeling angry about this. Or when I think about this, I'm feeling sadness. So there's some emotional resistance coming up. So here are some keys. Loneliness often is, it's just time for new connections. In our spiritual journey, we often feel so disconnected from who we were and we wake up and we're like, I, these people aren't my friends anymore. These, you know, my family isn't my family anymore, or I've been excluded or, you know, I no longer belong and I, or I don't feel like I belong or I don't want to belong, whatever happens. And so loneliness is often a big part of the spiritual journey, especially in the beginning, because we have to sort of unplug from the old often plugging into the new is not an instantaneous process. So loneliness just means it's time for new connections. We may be still showing up to the old party expecting to be let in when A, the party's over, or B, we don't really want to be at the party anymore. It's just like, well, I don't have any friends, so I might as well just go to the old ones, right? It's like, well, I don't want to be single, so I'll just stay in this crappy relationship. So sense of loneliness is often a sign that it's time for new connections. Boredom, boredom is it's just time to access and foster new skills and abilities. You're bored because you've already, you already know how to do it. You've already figured it out. There's no challenge there. And the spirit and the soul within you is always seeking expansion through experience. So use boredom as a clue to say, oh, it's just time to try some new stuff. It's just try to, time to turn my awareness and my focus to some new things to try to do and to find some new interests and new hobbies, new ways to apply my time and attention depression, it's often just a sign that it's time to claim new beliefs and a new way of being. Oftentimes when I look at depression energetically and I look at the geometry of depression, 
It's just a self that is collapsing under the weight of a life that no longer is true for them, right? It's like, why am I showing up at this job that I don't like, in this marriage I'm not happy in, doing these things that don't bring me joy anymore, but I don't know what to do and I don't know what else to try and I haven't really stopped to consider if there's another way of being. So depression is often just us slowing things down so that we can go, oh, I don't have to carry this anymore. If I don't want this, I can find a way to bring in something new or communicate my frustrations or whatever. So depression is often, it's just time to claim new beliefs and new ways of being. If the way that you believe yourself to be doesn't feel good and doesn't feel liberating, it's time to foster and cultivate some new beliefs. Anger. This one I love. This is a big one for me. What I've been really contending with is my own anger over the past few, actually the past several months, and really finding ways to engage with that and just watch it and be that benevolent masculine and go, wow, my little inner anger demon is just spinning out of control right now. And what I have found is anger is essentially it's time to allow yourself and others to be exactly as you are without the requirement to change. Anger often points us towards what we just need to accept. Because what? You can't change anything until you accept it as it is. I talk about this you know, example of when I was a housekeeper, when I had a house cleaning business. I'm never going to clean up the mess until I just accept it as it is already. Anger is us just trying to deny ourselves or our experience as it actually is. Look. You don't have to like the fact that things are the way they are, but being angry is often just like, oh, I don't want it to be this way and I gotta find a way to burn it down. Well, haven't we already discussed that just burning it down, it's only gonna grow back, it's only gonna come back, it's only gonna pop back up. So anger is just, okay, I don't like the way things are right now. I'm frustrated with myself, I'm afraid of myself, I'm, I'm discontent with my experience, I don't like where I am, you know, things aren't really happy or wonderful right now, okay. Just acknowledge it. Just acknowledge it and let yourself off the hook. Let the people in your life off the hook and just allow things to be as they are for the moment. And it is in that surrender to things as they are in the moment that opens the door for change, for shifts and transformation. The last thing that I wanna offer you, and this really to me is so, it's like the distillation of how I live my life right now. You know, as a living meditation, life is essentially a living meditation, constantly in a state of presence, constantly in a state of acceptance, constantly in a state of knowing that it is eternal and that I'm always expanding and growing in a state of becoming. And here's what Osiris said about meditation in the most recent um, Sphere Healing Group. Meditation is the act of letting the entirety of self be present without requirement. In other words, can you, your job, essentially, especially as the unified masculine, your job is to put your arms around all that you are, pull it close and say, I love you. I accept you. So can your life be a living meditation? Can you just be present and in observance of all that is here and all that wants to come in and all that wants to go without trying to resist, without trying to attach and pull it back? Just let it be. Just let it be what it is. I know that was a ton of information. I hope that it helps. As always, I'm here. If you need anything, andrewmartin.energy Martin, Andrew to book sessions. Check out my downloads. I have a lot of amazing MP3s on there. Also, the energy field maps are going gangbusters. Those are really, really wonderful. Lots of stuff for you to look at and check out. I do have run one request. If you have found my work to be of value or if it has been supportive or has you know helped shift your perception in any way, Please subscribe, like, and turn on the notifications for this channel and share, share, share with your communities, with your friends, with your groups, because I promise you, if it's worked for you, there's someone else out there that it can also help. I love you. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic June. I'll see you later. Bye.